Great Cemetery in West Milton, Ohio. Today is June the 3rd, 2012. Today we will hear five stories with the common theme of freedom. Two members of local business families to symbolize the free enterprise system we enjoy. A Quaker family from here in town that risked their own livelihood to help runaway slaves on the Underground Railroad. A Civil War captain will tell about his battles in the Civil War to free the slaves for good. And finally, a Vietnam War medic who gave up his own life trying to save his fellow soldiers. For that, he was awarded the Medal of Honor. We will also honor him with a real 21-gun salute. So come along, listen and learn that every tombstone has a story. Welcome everybody, I'm David Cote. This is my wife, Mary. Uh, my parents were Henry and Rebecca Cote, and they were the first, some of the very first settlers to come here from South Carolina in 1803. I was born here in 1823, July the 9th, and had four siblings. Unfortunately, my mother died when I was four years old, but my father raised us all as very devout Quakers. And he also taught us everything we needed to have a very good success with farming. Um, as I became older and was able to go out on my own, I married my wife, Mary Jane Teague. Her family was also early settlers from South Carolina. We got married on September the 20th in 1843. We took up farming out on the Milton Potsdam Pike, and our farm was a full section of land. Now, a section of land was one square mile. When they first surveyed all the land around here, it was done in square mile sections. That's why all of our country roads are laid out one mile apart. That amounted to 640 acres, so we had a pretty good sized farm. We were very successful. I was even on the county commissioners for about four years. I finally retired from farming and moved into town, built a house at the corner of Hayes and Miami Street. Nice big white house with a porch across the front. I'm sure you would admire it as you go home today, too. Uh, after I retired from farming, I went into the mercantile business, and for seven years I ran a store here in West Milton selling all kinds of hard goods, clothing, fabric, and everything else you could ever want here in town. While we were living on the farm, though, we got involved with the Underground Railroad. Being a Quaker and a moral person, I was appalled at the treatment of the Negroes in the South, so when the Friends Church got involved with trying to help the runaway slaves, we were eager to get involved, too. So as a one of the stops on the Underground Railroad, it was our job to hide people overnight and get them on to the next stop. There was a lot of our friends from the church who were involved with the Underground Railroad, so we would have meetings at the church so we would all know what was going on and who was involved here locally. Because it was always the chance that there would be slave hunters coming around because of the Fugitive Slave Act, anybody who was caught helping a slave escape was liable for jail time or a hefty fine, too. So we had to be very careful who we let know that we were hiding the slaves. So we devised little symbols that would tell people that, that it's safe to bring somebody into our house. And that's why we would have the meeting so everybody who was involved would know what kind of symbols we were using. As Mr. Coates said, we uh, had to make sure that the, the runaway slave knew where a safe haven was for them. And simple, the signs had to be simple, but yet obvious. And um, this is one thing we would do, would hang a, hang a quilt over our wash line or on our front porch or over our picket fence. And when they saw this, they knew that this was a safe place to go. Another symbol that they had, um, they would light a lantern. They could put it on the hitching post or on the porch or hang it and put it in a window. And this would tell the slave that this was a welcoming sight for them. If a slave saw a kettle pot, on the porch turned over that was not good that was not a safe place to go if it was turned up that meant that the slave was welcome to come there while the slaves were with us we would give them food and uh, clothing if they needed it and uh, shelter to hide them from the slave hunters um, in our own home we had a built-in cupboard that had a false ceiling that they could crawl into and then make it up to the second floor in the attic and then hide from the slave hunters. We were fortunate that we didn't really have too much trouble with the slave hunters around this area, but we were always worried about that. And it was our job to get the person from our place to the next stop on the Underground Railroad. We'd usually try to do that during the daytime because it was hard traveling at night when everything was so pitch dark. <clears throat> so we had to be very careful. Either we put them in the bottom of a wagon with hair on top of it or some way to hide them to get them onto the next place. 
and it had to be close enough that we could get them there and we could get back home before dark that night. The area around here, we usually took them either west to Castine or over east towards Troy. The route north, they were trying to get everybody to Canada because that was the only place that was safe. So the road was actually zigzagged all through the countryside, so you never knew which way anybody was going to go. We only knew the stops that were the next stop up from us. We really didn't know anybody else that, where they were going to. The, the route kind of split here and went towards Castine and towards Troy. Uh, most of the people that we had come through were young men that had no family ties, but once in a while we did get some women. And one of the ladies that we helped through after the Civil War found her way back, and we never could quite understand how she ever found her way back. Uh, but her name was Flossie, and she did come back and stayed for a couple of days to visit and then went on. So we never knew what happened to her after that. Uh, when we were taking people around, the slaves usually, once they got across the Ohio River, they got connected with the Underground Railroad. From that point on, they were escorted from stop to stop. Once in a while, they would try to make it on their own. But it was pretty tough because you couldn't give them a map because everything was secret. You didn't want anything written down as to where they were going next. Uh, so it was very practical to take the person from one stop to the next. Uh, as I said, we never knew what the next stop after where we took them to, but that person knew where to carry them on. Uh, usually the people who brought them to us, we were the only people that they knew. And there were several houses in this area, so if they come to our house and we either we weren't home or there was a sign or something that they should not stop, then there was always other houses they could take them to. Uh, we found that it was a very helpful thing to have these people come. Uh, we didn't make them hide until there was a chance that the slave hunters would be coming. Uh, as I said, it wasn't a big problem around here, but some areas they were really active slave hunters. And these guys were so nasty that if they found a Negro who was even a freed Negro, they would capture them and take them back. They could take them back and sell them into slavery again. So you had to be very careful about some of these guys. The man who really started the Underground Railroad across the Ohio River, John Rankin, if you ever get a chance to go to uh, his house down across the Ohio River, he, they estimate that he helped over 2,000 people come through his area. So that gives you an idea how many people were trying to escape. He was just one of the areas that they come across the Ohio River. Of course, the whole idea was to get them into a safe area away from everybody else. Since we were just one state up from Kentucky, which was a slave state, there was an awful lot of people trying to escape and get up here. They would try to try to get across the Ohio River in the wintertime when it was frozen, or in the summertime when it wasn't so freezing cold that they would uh, die trying to cross the river. So it was a big problem. They always thought if they could just get across the river, then they had it made. And usually if they could get across, they could get help and get the rest of the way up. Uh, so we were happy to do our part to uh, get them as many across as we could. Of course, after the Civil War, all that ended, and we were happy that uh, we did our part to help people along the way, too. Does anybody have any questions that I can answer? Yes. They didn't use boats to get across the river because they probably caught it. Uh, of course, they had no way of getting a boat. If they if they had some help, they usually the Underground Railroad was, didn't exist much below the Ohio River because it was in a slave state. Uh, some people did take a chance and get across the river and help people get down. If they knew there was a chance people were going to be coming, there were people with boats could go and throw them across. But, as a general rule, it wasn't like there was a ferry waiting for you at all. You had to make it on your own. And the Ohio River was a, a dividing line between the southern and the northern states, and that was the route that they, they had to cross that to get into freedom. And the Ohio River to them was their freedom, just like the Jordan River was the freedom for the Israelites escaping from Egypt. Hmm. That was one of the code words when the slaves talked about the Jordan River. It was the Ohio River they were trying to get to. Uh, Here's a loaded question for you. Are there any family names in the area that would be known today as part of the descendants of those slave hunters? Well, that's um, a kind of a negative aspect. No, most but of the slave hunters were from the south because that's where okay. all the money was from. Okay. Uh, some of these slaves, especially the really strong men, were worth five, six, seven hundred dollars So it was worthwhile to try to come up and capture them. Uh, if it was a household lady that was really not worth a lot of money, it was not worth the effort uh, of actually coming up and trying to find them. And usually once they got across the Ohio River and got into the system, uh, and that's how the Underground Railroad got its name. One of the uh, slave hunters was trying to follow a slave across, and he said once he got across the river, it seems like he went underground, and they couldn't understand whatever happened to him. He said, I, was, I saw him go across the river, and he went like he went underground. 
And from that point, it started to become known as the Underground, Underground Railroad. Railroad. You mentioned the pot on the front porch or wherever, the upside kid. down. Mm -hmm. Who did that? The homeowner, the homeowner. didn't want to. Yeah, that meant that it? that it wasn't safe for that runaway slave to stop there. Okay, so that means they could possibly help the, the people that were trying no, to capture. No, it just it, they were probably maybe. on the Underground Railroad. It just that that was at, not at a that time. Stop. Good at time, that time was not a gotcha. good time. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, if, if the quilt was, was out or the land mm -hmm. I knew about the quilt, yeah. I never yeah. heard about yeah. the If the word was out that there were slave hunters in the area sometimes, I yeah. see that's or why you had too would. many people already there, you were well, hiding. Well, that couldn't hide anymore. Yeah. Okay, got it. Got it. Good question. We have no <laughs> idea how many people actually went through this area, but if there was 2,000 went through one house in Cincinnati, there had to be quite a few people traveling through this area. So. And it went for years and years. It started very early on. They tried as soon as slavery started. There were people trying to help them escape. And Canada outlawed slavery very, very early on. Uh, so people knew if they could just get to Canada, they were all right. Of course, in this area, we also had Hanktown, which was a town of freed slaves out towards Laura. And they all came here in the 1850s. So there was a whole community of black people here already. Uh, so that may be why there weren't so many slave hunters coming. They knew that there was already an area here that they didn't dare mess with. <coughs> Good evening. I'm Barbara Tinnerman Cecil, but today I'm going to portray Helen Consuela Wurtz. I was born July 3rd, 1896, to Nellie and Herbert Lloyd Wurtz Sr. My siblings included Myrtle, Herbert Jr., or Bud, and Elizabeth, who died at the age of 10. The old world Wurtz, W E R T S, name was of German descent but was changed to W-E-R-T-Z. Most of you have heard of the Wirtz family as we have been longtime residents and business owners in West Mountain, starting with my father who was known as Bertie. In the early 1900s, Bertie was a barber. It was when you bought your own mug and brush and you could get a haircut and a shave for two bits. But around 1908, he decided to become a ticket agent for the Dayton, Covington, and Piqua Traction Company, and he also opened a pool hall and cigar shop at 11 North Miami Street, where the Angel Heaven gift shop is now. The steel traction lines carried the streetcars and brought loads of people to Overlook Park from Dayton to West Melton for social outings along the Stillwater River. Around 1924, the Model T Fords changed all of that and the traction lines were gone, so there was no need for a ticket office. And the traffic in my father's business was slow as well, so he decided to add items to his cigar sh store, such as bulk candy, kitchenware, and dry goods. In 1933, Petaskey's was in the current location, and Wurtz's was across the street, so they traded places and he made a dime store. I helped out at the store from time to time. I loved music and art <laughs> from a very early age. In May 1911, at the age of 15, I, along with my sister Myrtle, played a piano duet at the Christian Church, now UCC, for eighth grade graduation. I attended and graduated from Melton Union High School and received basic in instruction in painting from Otterbein College in Westerville, Ohio. I taught for several years in public schools, as did my sister Myrtle. She taught at Pig Eye School, nobody remembers that, do you? <laughs> and the Shiloh Elementary School in Dayton. She and I were not only sisters, but we were the best of friends. I was very fortunate to also study painting at the Dayton Art Institute, the San Antonio Art Galleries, Arts and Crafts in New Orleans, the New York Center Art School, and the Norton School of Art. In addition, I studied under Arnold Block of the New York Art Students League, and he described my paintings as having vigor and sensitivity. I also studied with many other famous artists. Originally, I loved watercolors, but branched out into other media and experimented with new techniques, including acrylic polymer. I was privileged to have several one-man shows and won many awards for my work. 
I am a lover of bright colors and my favorite subject to paint was trees. One time I went to Cape Cod for six weeks and painted the landscape. I belonged and served the Tri-Arts group of painters in Dayton for many years. I was also a member of the Dayton Society of Painters and Sculptures. Myrtle and I attended the Cincinnati Conservatory of Music. She studied and played the piano, and I studied and played the violin. Myrtle was the first female who played with the Cincinnati Symphony. We were very frugal, but we played the stock market and did rather well. My sister Myrtle and I loved to travel, and we were able to see many parts of the world long before it was fashionable to travel abroad. We went to many different countries countries on a freighter and sometimes we ate with the captain. Europe, Israel, Cuba, Morocco, Italy, London, Paris, and Berlin. We saw so much and had a grand time. I also did plays at the local theater and wrote children's books, but my true love was art. I always tried to make something beautiful and creative, even if it were out of weeds. Myrtle and I never married and I never got a driver's license. Myrtle took me everywhere. She and I lived together most of our adult life in a two-story house on North Miami Street. Do any of you re know where that is? Next to Kenny Beard? It's, it's a big, where Andersons used to live, Joyce Anderson, that's where they lived. After my sister retired from teaching, we started to go to Palm Beach, Florida for the winter, and I had several exhibitions there. My oil, acrylic, and watercolor paintings were described as poetic and a sensitive interpretation of reality and included scenes of my native Ohio and paintings of my travels. I love to bake angel food cakes and cookies for my great nephews and nieces. I would also let them come and paint in our upstairs. I let them drink coffee and I taught the girls to cook and butter crackers. I let them do all the things their parents wouldn't let them do. After my dad passed away, my brother Bud and wife Frances, also known as Flap, took over the family business and now their son Kay is the third generation owner. Today, as you all know, Kay and his late wife Faye's daughter Georgia runs the variety store. Wes and PJ run the Wurtz hardware store. Daughter Susan Sneed and granddaughter Michelle also help out. The store is the longest continuous business operation in downtown West Melton. And this is a footnote from me. Helen was a most, had a most fascinating life and enjoyed to the fullest. Her art, music, travels, theater, writing were all a part of who she was, a most talented person. She died September 29th, 1977, and is buried right Thank you for listening, and thank you for coming to the Second Cemetery Walk. <laughs> well, my name is uh, James Edward Sowery, and I was born in 1820 in the little town of Leeds in Yorkshire, England. Uh, my ancestry was from Wales, and uh, they were basically sheep herders, raising sheep and, and wool and weavers. Uh, this was back in the 1700s. Uh, in England, my father owned a woolen mill and I worked in the woolen mill until almost 18 years old. And just prior to my birthday, I joined the 7th uh, English Grenadier Army, which was a personal army of uh, uh, Queen Victoria, and after joining the army, I had to go on a six-month uh, military discipline uh, training in, in Ireland. And during that period of time, while I was in Ireland, China and England had a dispute, and we were ordered, that was the thing I was playing with. Oh. <laughs> I, I was ordered uh, to, uh, where was we at? We, was, we were ordered to go to China. On the way to China, we stopped at Gibraltar, and while we were there, the dispute was settled, and we ended up staying in Gibraltar for quite a long period of time. 
Well, there's nothing to do with the crawl. If you've ever seen it, it's just nothing but a big rock and no active duty whatsoever. We were there almost two years and uh, very monotonous. I persuaded my father to buy me out of the English Grenadiers, which he did. And I went back to England, back in the mill again. And while I was in the mill, uh, well, I guess it was a year and a half or so, I, I married to a lady of England, uh, Elizabeth Hartley. And in 1844, uh, there was two gentlemen, Beckel and Giddings, that bought equipment from England and had a ship to Dayton, Ohio, to set up a woolen mill. Well, they, they were businessmen, didn't know that much about it. So they had me leave England and go to the United States to set up, get an operation for them. So in 44, see so it would have been November of 44, I left for the United States, landed in New York, and of course you got to go across the mountains in the winter time. I got to Dayton, Ohio in March of 45. And in a fairly short period of time we had to mill up and running and I stayed on as a superintendent uh, of the mill for quite a while. Well, Mexico, the United States, Mexican War started and uh, Mr. Giddings, one of the owners of the mill, he put a, a company together. Company B of the 1st Regiment of Ohio Volunteer Infantry. And I was first to join. I, I liked the military way of life, so to speak. And immediately we were sent down to New Orleans and then over to Brazo, San Diego, to this battle down there. And after the, just right after the Battle of Monterey, I got the Mexican fever. And I don't know if you're familiar about that or not, but uh, it's pretty severe. Uh, quite a few people went into shock, and if you went into shock, 50% uh, of them died. So this persisted for quite a long period of time, and uh, the uh, regiment had to leave without me. So I was mustered out and, and got sent home with honors and, and back to the to the Dayton, Ohio. Well, in that period of time. Uh, I came up to West Milton, Ohio, here again, there's the, the different wool mills up here, and, and uh, so I came up and worked at several mills here in West Milton uh, for a period of time, and then about, the, about here come the uh, uh, cannons going off in Fort Sumter, and we got involved in the Civil War. Well, immediately I went back into service, and uh, I went into the Company E of the 48th Regiment of the Ohio Volunteer Infantry. And basically because of my prior military experience, I went in as a second lieutenant. And uh, so I, I gotta use the cheat sheet here. I got too many things, too many things to go for a man my age. I told you this morning I was gonna use that for an excuse. Pretty good excuse, I think. Under 92 years old, that's... Yeah, 192 years old. That's you you, know, you got to give, you gotta give somebody a little leeway. Just a little. Well, anyhow, uh, as I say, I went in as a second lieutenant, and after the Battle of Shiloh, I was promoted to first lieutenant. And uh, the second battle, the second fight of Shiloh, which is also called Pittsburgh Landing, I was in the thickest of the fight watching every movement of the enemy that I could see from where I was at. And I could see they was just kind of wrapping around us. And soon he was going to get to the place and capture us. And it was unknown to the, to the officers at that time. So I, I ran up to Colonel Sullivan and Sir, you know, we're being uh, captured. We're, we're, being, we're being surrounded and we're going to end up being captured if we don't back off. So he saw that that was taking place and he ordered double quick retreat. And basically because when we got back to safe distance a couple days later, I was commissioned a captain. Because he felt that I saved the battalion or the, the regiment. And, but from that point on, we basically got into the 
the heavy work in the Civil War, that's where I have a hard time remembering all the dates. Uh, I was in all the battles in which my regiment was engaged, plus many other skirmishes not reported. I was at the capture of Corneth, the first attack on Vicksburg, the second battle of Corneth in the Arkansas Post. After the last battle of my division, I was ordered to the camp on the Mississippi. Our first service was to Milliken's Bend, then followed the battles of Magnolia Hills, Raymond, Champion Hills, and the Black River Bridge, and then the big siege of Vicksburg. After the battle of Vicksburg, our command was transferred to the Gulf Department and was ordered to Matagorda Bay. After two months, we returned to New Orleans and up the Red River. At Sabina Crossroad, our regiment was captured and sent to Camp Tyler. For six and a half months, our regiment was held in an open field without shelter and very little food. In uh, October 1864, myself and my men was paroled, sent back to New Orleans and exchanged. While we were in uh, Fort Tyler, an incident took place where we, when we were captured, the uh, color bearer realized that there was not going to be any escape, so he took the flag off of the staff and hid it in his haversack, which was a little bag we carried with us with our food in it, put a little meal, meal on top of it so it would not be discovered. And uh, as soon as things kind of cooled off a little bit, he brought it to me and we, we tried to decide what to do with it, so we, we ended up temporarily burying it because they had, there was rumor around that there was a flag and they won it. You know, that's a trophy that they won. So after a few days, it kind of cooled off a little bit and uh, we decided we, we couldn't leave it buried because we were afraid it was gonna mold. So I unraveled my socks and got thread and we dug the flag up and we sewed it in, in uh, Captain Corvallis's coat, using the lining of his coat. And he carried it that way till the end of the to the end of the war. So basically, we saved the flag. And uh, but back to my cheat sheet again. <laughs> Hard to remember all this stuff. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he was first to. Well, this ended my active duty. I remained near the close. Uh, near to the close of the war it was mustered out on January 1865. We had a terrible loss of life during the war between the North and the South. Over 560,000 people died. On returning to my home, I worked in the woolen mills in West Milton in the capacity of superintendent for three years. I then operated a mill of my own accord for some time and afterwards wove carpets in my own home until 1898. I had remarried in August of 1851 to Mrs. Hester Hoover. Now, Hester Hoover was widowed, and she is in the line with Herbert Hoover, uh, her offspring. I, I, I can't trace that back. Uh, the Saris have no connection to the Hoovers, except through my wife, Mary. Uh, we, have, we have two sons. Hester, by the way, had seven children when I married her. So, and we had two sons of our own, James and Thomas. Uh, James is uh, married at Polk Grove, and uh, Thomas is buried right here beside my tombstone. Uh, I own a farm of 40 acres, and my wife also has a farm of 40 acres on Eddings Road, just south of 571, just across the river. And uh, so we had plenty to do there. I've been a staunch and inflexible member of the Republican Party since its organization and all of my power to promote its growth and success, ensure its success. I become one of the charter members of the Duncan Post number 477 GAR, which is the Grand Army of the Republic of West Milton, and has been honored with the office of commander. We've got some pictures here showing the, the members of that Duncan Lodge. Now that Duncan Lodge, uh, for the people that are that is familiar with the area, was in the upstairs above the Kenny Drug Store. Uh, 
well, with B.J. Ford prior to that, I guess it was. And uh, that'd be where Fox's Pizza is now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 And uh, as I look back, on, and I feel blessed with my life, I'm hoping some small way I help make history in this great land. This was the same building, but they didn't understand that. Hello, my name is Ralph Martindale. I was born in Pattytown, Ohio, which is right outside of Laura. My dad was Albert W. Martindale, and my mother was Bessie Bressman. I was born December 2nd, 1900. When I was old enough to work, my dad put me to work in the general store that he had in Pattytown. I cleaned shelves, I cleaned the floor, and I also cleaned the spittoons that all the farmers used all the time. In the winter time, the farmers would come in and sit by the pot belly stove and tell their stories and little jokes. In the summertime, they would sit out on the liar's bench and still tell more stories and jokes while other farmers would be out playing horseshoes. They would get hungry, so they would come in and buy a piece of cheese, and they would also get a handful of crackers out of the cracker barrel for only a nickel. In 1912, my dad bought a truck. This was on a postcard that we would send out. And we would send the postcard out and say, we are coming around to your place. If you would like us to stop, please tie a white hanky or on your mailbox or on your fence post and we will make sure that we stop to help you out. If they didn't have money to buy what we were selling, we had crates underneath here that we would put chickens and turkeys in, so we would barter. And then maybe the next house we went to, maybe they didn't have money, but they wanted to barter for the chickens and the turkeys, so we just went back and forth through that. This is my dad, Albert, and this is me as a young lad. In 1917, my dad came up with a coupon concept, and that was way ahead of the Kroger time. So they would buy 10 cents worth of groceries and they would get a uh, coupon for other goods that we sold. In 1920, I married Della Swigert and we lived in Union, Ohio. And if you're coming up north on 48 at the stoplight at Markdale Road and 48, we are the second house on the right hand side. That's where we lived when we first got married. Then we moved in 1926 to 42 West Hayes Street, where I lived till the end of my time. We had three children, Beulah, Kenneth, and Francine. Francine lived to be three years old. She got measles and there wasn't anything we could do for her, so she passed away. Then um, I was driving my car back and forth to Hamilton so I could earn money for us to, to live on. And I would stop at every place all the way back from Hamilton to see if they needed any shelves cleaned or stocked, and also if they had any meat that they needed cut. On one of these fateful trips, I was in an automobile accident and I broke my hip. And there wasn't really much to do for your hips back then. So I had to suffer quite a long time with that. In 1936, my wife had colon cancer and was so bad that they had to operate in the upstairs bedroom of our house. And she wasn't expected to live, but the doctor we had performed a surgery that was pretty close to a miracle. After that, our children and all of us worked at different jobs trying to survive again. And then my son went to the Navy in 1942. He would send his checks back to us to help us survive. In 1946, he came back. He worked several different jobs, but he also helped at the store. And he would help build, we built the store then out of cinder block. In the late 50s, or early 50s, we built uh, on the land next to us. We bought the Nellie Smith property and expanded out. Now my wife, she would drive to Dayton and she would pick up produce and she would pick up groceries for us. And then she would go to Troy to the meat packing plants and she would buy sides of beef, throw it in the car, bring it back, and then we would cut the meat up for the customers. 
we were one of the only stores that was open on Sundays. And we would sell different, uh, we sold glazed donuts by the dozens on Sunday mornings. And that was through the Miami Made Bread Company. We also sold uh, the Journal Herald and the Columbus Dispatch of all papers. My wife would get up at four o'clock in the morning when Borden's would deliver our milk and we would let them in, they would deliver their milk, and she would also have a cup of coffee waiting for them. So they would chit chat a little bit, and then they would go on their way. In 1971, I passed away, and my son Kenneth took over for me with his wife and his three children, Yvonne, Della, and Charles. And they kept the store going until 2000 when they closed the doors. That was 54 years of grocery business that we were in. And it was a wonderful time. The customers and the community were just wonderful to us. And we miss the people so much right now. So we thank you, and that is the end of my tale. Well, hello everybody. I am Joseph LaPointe, Jr., and you can call me Guy. I was born July 2nd, 1948, to Jean Louise LaPointe and Joseph Guy LaPointe Sr. in Dayton, Ohio. At age 20, I was killed in Vietnam on June 2nd, 1969, near Tam Key, Hill 376. You know, there's a whole lot more to me than just a beginning and an end, and I am here to tell you that story. I'm here to tell you the story how one man can make a difference in the world. And like a stone tossed into still waters, such was my life the ripples of which are still felt today, some 43 years after my death. I had a bit of a tough go from the start. When I was born, my mother and father were not getting along so well. In fact, they would be divorced soon after I was born. My mother was a bit on the wild side, especially for 1948. She liked going out a whole lot more than staying in with me. So much so that I nearly died of neglect at six weeks old. Well, my dad took me and headed off to my aunt and uncles and asked them to help raise me, and they agreed. Um, <clears throat> they took me in and loved me as their own. So much so that when my father got married a second time, they weren't about to let me go. So I stayed with them. I'd visit my father every other weekend. That was tough as he was starting a new family and I just didn't feel like I fit in there. I loved my great aunt and great uncle and they just let me be a boy. At 10, I'd run along the creeks and streams, playing in the woods. I'd swing like a monkey from tree to tree. I felt like I'd found my home in the great outdoors, amongst the trees and the weeds and surrounded by the rabbits and the squirrels. That was the place for me. And the birds, ah, the birds, I loved the birds. The different sizes and shapes and colors, they fascinated me. Well, when I got into high school at Northridge, I became a volunteer at the Allwood Autobahn Center. I cared deeply about the environment long before there was an environmental movement. I enjoyed camping, hiking, studying the natural environment, art, playing my guitar, poetry, writing, and I loved to make people laugh and tell a good story. And oh yeah, girls. Well, I went on to graduate high school in May of 1966. I moved to the Clayton area and worked as a mail carrier for the Inglewood Post Office, a job where I got to be outside most of the day. I loved that. I did want to go to college, though, and I applied to several schools. Well, one weekend in the fall of 1967, some friends and I went to Yellow Springs to hang out in some of the off-campus off bars and have a few beers. I saw a girl I knew I had to meet. Her friend got up to get a beer, and I made my move. I slid right in and I asked her to dance, and she did, she agreed. We hit it off pretty good, so much so that I asked her out on a date the very next day. Little did I know she already had her eye on me. She'd spotted me in a coffee shop in Dayton, Ohio and never said anything. Well, whatever, I'm just glad we met. After that date, I went home and told my stepmother that I had met the girl I was going to marry someday. That girl was Cindy Phelan. We, we went out and hit it off great, and I knew. And sometimes you just know when you've met that person for you, and that was her. 
Well, the Vietnam War. The Vietnam War was in full swing in 1968. Public opinion, public opinion of the war was just starting to turn, and many people were starting to question what was going on over there, and if we, the U.S., really needed to be involved in it. I didn't know the answers, but I knew one thing. I didn't believe in killing people. If my draft number was called, no way was I going to Vietnam and killing anybody. Well, my number was called. I spoke with my minister, and he helped me to become a conscientious objector. I was still going to Vietnam, but I was going to help the wounded soldiers. I was going to be an Army medic. So, on May 8, 1968, I headed to basic training. When I came home from boot camp, I married Cindy. Shipped out shortly after for Army medical training in Texas. After medical training, I came home on leave. I spent the month of October with my beautiful young wife, family, and friends. I had little hope. I had learned that the medics in Vietnam were being targeted by the enemy. If you ever see film footage of the Vietnam War, you'll notice that the Army medics and corpsmen do not wear the familiar red cross on their sleeve, and that's why. Well, I was going to Vietnam, and I didn't think I'd return home. Many thoughts ran through my head, like taking off to Canada, but I knew that wasn't right. So on November 7, 1968, I was assigned to the 2nd Squadron, 17th Cavalry, 101st Airborne Division of the United States Army. In Vietnam, I made many friends and did my best to help my fellow soldiers by patching them up and getting them out of harm's way when I could. Vietnam was a beautiful country, the kind of place you see in travel brochures. I always kept my Birds of Vietnam book handy, because I, when I'd see the beautiful birds there, I wanted to know what they are and all about them. Vietnam was also the most ugly place in the world. The things I saw, the suffering I witnessed, would make the strongest of men break down. I never let Cindy know of these awful things in my letters to her. I did share them with my father. He was a World War II veteran and I thought he would understand. And somehow that helped. On January 20th, 1969, my son Joseph G. the Point III was born. It had to be hard for Cindy raising him on her own. I wanted so bad to be there by her side, helping and watching our baby boy grow. Fate had another plan for me. On June 2nd, 1969, in Vietnam, near Hill 376, things went bad. Fighting was heavy that day. I saw two men down, wounded, and stuck where they lay. I ran through heavy automatic weapon fire to reach them. I treated them and shielded them with my body, from enemy fire, getting hit twice myself. Along came a grenade, and that was it for all three of us. We were dead. These actions would earn me the Congressional Medal of Honor. I would not live to see my only son. I was leaving my young, beautiful wife, Cindy, a widow. I did not go to Vietnam to win medals. I went to help those in need. I hope my actions did just that. I hope that the dozens of men I helped went home to live good lives, have children. I hope that even if in some small way I planted a seed, a seed of caring and hope for the world and their fellow man. My actions in Vietnam did not go unnoticed. I also received other awards, including the Silver Star, the Bronze Star, the Army Commendation Medal, the Good Conduct Medal, the National Defense Medal with one star, the Vietnam Campaign Medal, the Republic of Vietnam Gallantry, Purple Heart, and of course my Medal of Honor. There are a number of other tributes in my honor as well, including Route 49 from I-70 to downtown Dayton, Joseph G. LaPointe Highway, LaPointe Village in Fort Campbell, Kentucky, U.S. Army Training Center, Fort Sam Houston, Texas, Joseph G. LaPointe Heliport, Fort Benning, Georgia, Joseph G. LaPointe, U.S. Army Reserve Center, Dayton, Ohio. Joseph G. LaPointe Drive, near Walter Reed Hospital at the Enlisted Housing. LaPointe Health Center, Fort Campbell, Kentucky. And the VFW post right here in West Milton, post 8211, if you've ever seen the little bridge that crosses the creek, that is named in my honor as well. Now I'm sure at this point you're asking yourself, why am I buried at Riverside Cemetery in West Milton, Ohio? Well, my father's family migrated to this area in the 1930s in search of work. They were from the upstate New York area and worked in the mines there. 
They came here and settled in West Milton to work in the local stone quarries. My grandfather and great-grandfather lay beside me here. The family had one more plot, so they decided to place me here. It seems like a fitting place among the banks of the Stillwater River, among God's creatures, big and small. My son Joseph the Point the Third would go on to serve in the Army himself. He's now out of the Army and is an IT guy in Vandalia. My wife Cindy would go on to marry again. She worked for EDS in Dayton, Ohio and has recently retired. She keeps busy by volunteering at the VA and working with veterans for veterans' causes. Cindy was once asked if people would remember Guy for one thing, what would that one thing be? Her answer was to know that Guy was the most compassionate, caring young man she'd ever known, and that he put the, welfares, put the welfare of others above himself. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Rec Carpenter. It's been my honor to portray Joseph Guy LaPointe and tell you his story. And it's also my honor to introduce to you, Miss Cindy Daphne, formerly Miss Cindy LaPointe, Joseph's widow. Thank you for coming out today, and I hope you can come back for our 7.30 tribute to Joseph. Good afternoon, everyone. It is an honor for me, on behalf of the American Legion Pro 707 in Inglewood, Ohio, to be a part of this memorial occasion. It's not often that we experience knowing or being in the presence of greatness or to share in the memory of one who made the supreme sacrifice as did Joseph Guy LaPointe. It was 43 years ago on June the 2nd when Guy, who was a God-fearing young man, sacrificed his life for his fellow soldiers on an all but forgotten hill number 376 near Tam Key in the Republic of South Vietnam. Performing his duty as a medic, Guy was rescuing and giving comfort to the wounded soldiers when he fell mortally wounded. For his gallantry actions and extreme bravery without regard to his life, Guy was awarded the country's most highest medal, the Congressional Medal of Honor, posthumously. Though the sound of being a medic seems simplistic, it is these men that are most often valiant and revered and held in the highest esteem by their fellow comrades. Armed usually with just their medic bag, a caring heart, these angels of mercy would come to the aid of the fallen comrades in some of the most dangerous, deplorable, and perilous conditions. Their bravery was surpassed by none and known by all. It is good that we were given the life of Guy if only for a short time. What he did with his life cannot be erased, and his goodness and bravery will be carried on throughout generations. We, of faith, find comfort in knowing that God brings home to him good, faithful men, and Guy LaPointe was one of those true, heroic gentlemen. The R operation will conclude after the end of taps. Under guard. Team. Hut. Port. Arm. Unlock. Aim. Fire. 